morning. I want to just take a moment right now to encourage you to use your peripheral vision to look a little bit left and right. I think you'd notice, as I notice from up here, that there's a lot of new faces in the room today. And I think that's exciting, and I think I want to encourage every single one here today to welcome those visitors, to encourage them to come back, treat them as our honored guests, as we so often say. So after services today, I encourage you to stick around for a little bit and talk to some of the new friendly faces we see around us. This morning, I want to talk about the idea of determination. And while studying for this lesson, I came across countless examples of people from recent history who I would consider as determined. I read about a man named Johnny Fulton. He was run over by a car at the age of three years old. He suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, and compound leg fractures. Didn't look like he was going to make it, let alone ever walk again. But he was determined. He didn't give up. In his early 20s, he later ran a half, a half marathon. Walt Disney, he was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old. But he, deter he was determined, he continued. Shelly Mann, also paralyzed by polio when she was five years old, but she didn't give up. She eventually claimed eight different swimming records for the US and won a gold medal in the 1956 Olympics. Lou Gehrig, he was a clumsy kid a goofy ball player, and the boys in his neighborhood never let him play with them because, honestly, he just wasn't that good. But he was committed. He was determined. And we know he's now entered into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson. He wasn't able to read until he was 10 years old. But he was a committed person. He tried hard. He persevered. He became president of the United States. Determination, defined at its simplest form, is the resolve to persevere despite difficulties. It's a powerful force. It's a force that propels us forward when everything else around us encourages us to surrender. This morning, I want to look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And I want to look at it through the lens that these are the qualities that we, as individual Christians, need to pursue with determination in order to fulfill our purpose, none, in order to even be considered Christians, in order to please God. In this passage, Paul highlights the humility of Jesus the Christ, but he also emphasizes the, de the, the determination with which he pursued God's will. So before we go ahead, and dive into our lesson. I want to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16 in its entirety. Because as we get into it, we will jump around just a little bit. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless 
and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. The first section I want to look at today comes from the first two verses of Philippians chapter 2, and I want to call it determined unity. If there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, affection, or mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one another. Paul's words here, he's emphasizing, he's highlighting the significance of unity within the body of Christ. This morning in class, we talked about John chapter 17, and Jesus prayed a prayer similar to this, encouraging us, commanding us to unity. Unity among believers is different, though, than unity with your friends or with your coworkers or in a company or in a group. Unity among believers, among fellow Christians, is deeper. It's stronger than any superficial or surface-level matter. It's deeper. It requires a shared mindset, a genuine love for one another, calls for being of the same mind, in full accord, as we defined it this morning, with the same mission, with the same purpose, with the same drive, with the same goal of salvation in mind. It means aligning our hearts and desires with God's purposes. All of us together, seeking above our own. This unity extends beyond our personal preferences or our differences, who we like and who we don't like who we identify as like us and not like us. This unity encompasses a common purpose, a common truth rooted in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Emphasizing, again, the importance of unity and agreement in the body of Christ. This verse calls us to prioritize fellowship, prioritize unity with one another. It asks us to prioritize understanding in our interactions with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It encourages us to engage in respectful dialogue and to seek the truth in a way that leads to a shared understanding rather than offending the person we call family, rather than division, rather than upsetting one another, calls us to pursue the truth in a way that calls for a shared understanding of the gospel, where we all know the truth together. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And above all these, put on love, which binds together everything in perfect harmony. Love serves as a central force that binds all the virtues together in perfect unity, in harmony, togetherness. Practically applying this verse means cultivating a deep and genuine love for one another, for our brothers and sisters, for the people we sit next to every Sunday and Wednesday and call family. We need to love them in order to be united with them. It prompts us to show compassion, to show kindness, forgiveness, and selflessness in our relationships with each other, and to create an environment of belonging, of shared purpose, of unity. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, one in body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Here again, we see an emphasis on the diversity of the body, diversity of the believers within the body. We're all different. Just as our physical bodies have various parts and distinct functions, the body of Christ is made up of various parts, distinct individuals, people who are different from one another with different perspectives, different abilities, different talents, and yet we're called to be united with one another. Use those talents. Use those different perspectives. Use those different backgrounds for a common goal of unity. The Bible constantly emphasizes the importance of a shared mindset, a shared mindset that is built on love and on purpose. And this determination, this determination to pursue unity with 
requires us to align our hearts with God's will. It requires us to cultivate a deep love for God and for our fellow brothers and sisters and for all of mankind. Ultimately, determination and unity calls us to persevere in building a community that is rooted in love and understanding and the pursuit of truth together. We need to foster and imitate this example in order to cultivate a determined unity, knowing that in our shared purpose, Christ's church is honored and God is glorified. Going down to Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, it reads, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Father, Paul here is highlighting the unparalleled determination found in Jesus' humility, something that we could never comprehend, something we could never imitate to its fullest extent, and yet it's something we're called to try to do. Paul here is emphasizing the idea that despite being equal with God, Jesus the Christ chose to empty himself chose to take on the form of a servant, a human, the people who disrespected, despised, and sinned against God, chose to take that form and become obedient, obedient to the point of death on a cross for whose benefit? For our benefit. That is a level of humility that we are told to strive for. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, it says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus teaches that true greatness is found not in kingship, not in positions of power, but in servitude, servanthood, by humbling ourselves, by serving others. By doing so, we align ourselves with God's perspective of greatness. Rather than seeking recognition or elevating ourselves up or trying to find this position of power that makes us feel good inside, we're told to demonstrate a determined humility, a humility whose action is found in servitude. Determined humility calls us to serve others selflessly. Just as Jesus took on the form of a servant, we are called to consider others more significant than ourselves. There are a lot of things in life that I would like. There are a lot of things in life that I want. And yet, as a Christian, I'm told to take those thoughts, those desires, those wants, and set them aside at the benefit of serving others, fulfilling the needs of others before my own. In James chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. We're not just supposed to be humble with our interactions with our brothers and sisters. We're not just supposed to be humble in our interactions with people outside of the church but we need to be humble before the Lord. James is reminding us that as we humble ourselves before God, as we acknowledge his lordship, as we acknowledge our need and dependence on him, God responds with grace. God responds with mercy. And cultivating a humble attitude involves recognizing that everything we have here, all of our earthly possessions, all of our relationships, everything good that has ever happened to us, isn't because we worked hard and got lucky. Because God gave it to us. Cultivating a humble attitude means we need to seek to understand the perspectives of others and of God because that's how he treated us. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man... 
I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul here, again, emphasizing the importance of seeking God's approval rather than the people around us. Seeking God's approval rather than the world, what the world expects us to have, what the world expects us to do, what our boss expects us to do. Instead of seeking that approval, instead of seeking those standards, we're called to seek the standards of God, his truth, his grace, his approval. In a world that often exalts self-promotion, a world that honors self-recognition, we need to humble ourselves. We need to recognize that our God's grace and guidance is all we need. We position ourselves. We need to position ourselves to receive his approval. The concept of determined humility calls for us to emulate the example of Jesus Christ, his determination to humble himself, even to the point of death, challenges us to prioritize the well-being of others, the power and glory deserved by God the Father, and our own limitations, knowing that nothing we have is our own, knowing nothing that we do has any power at all except through God the Father. And by embodying this humility, by pursuing this determined humility, we become servants who seek to serve others, servants who follow the teachings of Jesus, who proclaim true greatness is found in servitude, and we humble ourselves before God, acknowledging that we are dependent on him. And through this determined humility, we bring glory to God. We reflect the transforming power of his love, the transforming power of the gospel, the transforming power of the new covenant message and his salvation and his love to the world around us. Continuing in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We need to have determined obedience. Paul encourages the Philippians, and us by extension, to embrace an obedience and actively work out our salvation. We are called to approach our spiritual growth and maturity with fear and trembling, recognizing that God is at work within us, empowering us to align ourselves with his will and to fulfill his purpose, his mission, his work here on earth. And it's important to note, to work out your own salvation means actively living out the essence of our shared salvation, actively living it out in our daily lives. It involves applying the transforming power of the gospel to every single aspect of our being, our thoughts, our attitude, our actions. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And we know hearing the word is important. If we never heard the word, none of us would be here today, right? But James is emphasizing the importance of not only hearing the word, but also putting it into action. He warns us against a self-deception, reminding us that true faith is evidenced by our obedience to God's Word. Determined obedience calls us not only to hear the word of God, but to actively live it out, to actively put it into practice. It involves aligning our actions with the teachings and the commandments of Scripture rather than being content with just knowing, rather than just going to church to check off the boxes. I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday evening. I heard the Bible multiple times this week. No, it's about living the gospel message, living a life that imitates Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God who called us is holy, and he calls us to a life of holiness. This morning we talked about the idea of sanctification, being set apart for God's purpose and pursuing this sanctification, pursuing this holiness is the process of becoming more like Christ. Again, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Allowing him to work through us in our lives, allowing him to shape our character, allowing him to transform us into his image. And this type of obedience is hard. This type of obedience requires work, requires prayer 
and Bible study and fellowship and accountability and servitude and all those things that make you tired at the end of the day. And yet, that is a determined obedience we are called to pursue. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul, again, is assuring the Philippians and us that the work that God started, the work that Jesus started when he was here on earth, the work that the apostles let out after he died, the work that the early Christians, the early church were carrying out was one, the work of God, and two, it will be completed. Recognizing that God is in control, recognizing that God is at the helm allows us to rely on his strength rather than our own. It allows us to trust that he will equip us to fulfill his purpose. It invites us to surrender control. It invites us to seek alignment with his will. It allows us to surrender to determined obedience. See, this type of obedience, it calls for more than just a passive faith. It calls for more than just following a list of rules. It pushes us to actively apply the teaching of Scripture actively apply the example of Jesus, actively apply the Bible in our daily lives, our thoughts, our words, and our actions. By doing so, we become living testimonies of who God is, of God's power. And by aligning our actions with his word, by following this obedience, we have the ability to impact those around us with the truth and the love of the gospel. Continuing on in verses 14, 15, and 16. It says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. In a world filled with negativity, in a world filled with contention, Paul urges us, encourages us to exhibit determined faithfulness in all things by resisting temptation to grumble or to argue. We demonstrate the power of Christ's love, the power of his message, the transforming power of the gospel message, the transforming power of salvation. And as we hold fast to this word, to this word of life, to this gospel message, the truth, this unifying truth, our determined faithfulness becomes a shining light that illuminates the darkness and draws others towards the truth. In 1 Peter 4, verse 9, it says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Peter here is encouraging believers to show hospitality without grumbling. Grumbling, it seems easy enough, but the point is our actions, our attitudes should be characterized by love, by selflessness, without complaining, without murmuring, without feeling like it's an obligation, and I just got to do it because I'm obligated to do so. It challenges us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude and hospitality. It encourages us to cultivate a spirit that reflects the love of Christ. So instead of engaging in negativity, We need to choose to exhibit a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of trust in God's power, in his message, in his hope. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, the author of Hebrews here is encouraging believers, encouraging us to hold true the confession of their hope, hold true the confession of our hope without wavering, remaining firm in our faith, clinging to the promises and the truths found in God's word. Determined faithfulness entails holding true to the word of life. The teachings, the promises of scripture involves remaining firmly planted, rooted in God's truth with a faith that doesn't waver, a faith that allows his word, to guide us, to shape our lives. By resisting this temptation to grumble or dispute or to feel like it's just an obligation and I got to do it because I got to do it. By resisting that temptation, we reflect the power of Christ's love, 
again. The transforming nature of the gospel. The power of God the Father in salvation. So in a world filled with division, in a world filled with uncertainty, in a world that Paul calls crooked and perverse, we're told to remain faithful, to be firmly rooted. For what purpose? To glorify God so that we can be become a beacon of light, a beacon of light that illuminates the darkness and points others towards a new and better life. See, this theme of determination, these qualities we are called to be determined to pursue, weaves through the various aspects of our Christian walk. And we're called to embrace it, whether it be uni unity or humility, or obedience or faithfulness. Each aspect requires a firm resolve to be rooted in the truth, to live out our faith with commitment and with purpose. Determined unity challenges us to pursue harmony and love within the body of Christ. Determined humility calls us to imitate the life that Jesus walked, the sacrifice that he made. Obedience urges us to align our will with God's, to seek to follow his good works. And faithfulness challenges us to remain steadfast, to remain committed in Christ, even when life is hard even when there are challenges that we're not ready to face. But it's important to remember, as we reflect on these aspects of determination, we need to recognize that our determination is not based on our own strengths or abilities, but God, but on the power of God who works within us. And it's only through that relationship, only through our relationship with God the Father, that we can demonstrate this type of determination in our lives. So the question is, do you have that relationship? Are you united with God the Father and Son? If you have not yet made that commitment, if you've not committed yourself to following Jesus, to be united in his church, if you've not yet been transformed by the gospel power and given a new life, I encourage you to take the steps to change that. We know that the Bible calls us to hear the gospel, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Believe it, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Repent of our past sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess faith in Jesus, Romans 10, 10 and be baptized in his death, burial, and resurrection. Galatians 3, 27. If you haven't taken those steps, if you've not yet formed this relationship with God, if you've not yet entered his body and his church, I would love to help you do that this morning. Or if you've taken these steps and you've fallen off the path, your determination has wavered and you haven't been living up to the standard set by God or you haven't been living up to the title of Christian. If you've failed, I encourage you to take the steps you need to take. If you need the prayers of the congregation, I encourage you because we are a community that encourages, that embraces those who need us. We believe in restoration. We rejoice in the opportunity to pray for one another because we're all on a journey of faith. And at times we're going to fall off. At times we're going to make mistakes. At times we're going to slip up and stumble from the path, but we understand that change is only possible with the power of God. Whatever your needs are this morning, if you need the prayers of the congregation, if you need to be baptized into Christ, if you need somebody to study with or just a shoulder to cry on, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing this morning.